When it comes to misunderstood animals, sharks are at the top of the list. We fear them, persecute them, and some of us even eat them. But sharks play a vital role in our oceans that is irreplaceable by any other group of animals. As shark numbers decline and more media is produced to raise shark conservation awareness, it leads us to ask, what exactly is going on with our sharks? How can we coexist with these toothy apex predators and restore ecosystem balance in our seas? Also, how does one go about studying sharks when we ourselves are not made to last long in ocean environments? In this episode, we explore these questions and so much more with a woman researcher that is studying some famous and not so famous sharks in a natural wonder of the world. Today, we are sitting down with Camila Arnes, hammerhead and thresher shark researcher in the Galapagos Islands. Camila knew from a very early age that she wanted to be a marine biologist when she grew up and traveled abroad during university to gain the skills she needed to make a conservation impact back in her home. After years abroad in Australia, she returned to Ecuador to fulfill her dream of working on the Galapagos Islands. Through a series of serendipitous events, she became the leading researcher on the island's famous hammerhead shark population to learn about their feeding and moving behaviors. Now she is continuing her sharky research by turning her attention to the significantly less understood thresher shark to hopefully understand their lives, thereby contributing to their conservation. I seriously learned so much from Camila. We have a blast discussing her childhood and growing up to become a marine biologist, leaving her country to gain the skills she needed to make an impact back home. The very interesting project that brought her to the Galapagos, everything hammerhead shark in the Galapagos, and what we all can do to help save sharks no matter where we are in the world. And for those of you that are not currently watching this on YouTube, at about the 30-ish minute mark, Camila begins a slideshow with some visuals of her work, and we do our best to verbally explain the images we are looking at. If you can safely navigate to the website, then head on over to episode 110 show notes to check out each image at the appropriate timestamp. Trust me, you can't miss the photo of the baby hammerhead or her free diving with sharks. They're absolutely great. All right, friends, please enjoy this fun conversation with Camila. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking about this really special group of animals that we haven't had on the show yet. And I'm so excited that you are the one that's going to introduce us to this very special group of animals and also in a very cool part of the world. So before I completely spoil it on what you do and what you study, could you tell us where did you grow up and, and what took you down this path in, into marine biology? Yeah, just, just share us, share us your journey. I would love to hear all of it. Okay, hey, thanks for having me here. I'm so excited. And yeah, I'm super passionate about what we're going to talk about. I'm not going to spoil it yet as well. So I, I'm from Ecuador and I grew up in the coast of Ecuador in... Guayaquil, which is like one of the largest cities, it is just two hours away from the coast. But every every summer, I would just go down the coast and explore the rocky pools. And I think that's how every marine biologist is made, just like exploring, having that curiosity. And I always knew I wanted to work with something related to the ocean. But I, as I don't know, as a six year old, I had no idea that marine biology was a thing. Yeah, as I grew older, I I, yeah, I learned about marine biology and science, and that's how I got into the, this field. Yeah, and, and so what was next? I mean, all of us as young little boys and girls, we, we always have these passions, but we don't exactly know which ones materialize. So what was it about this specific thing of just like, you know, playing in these fun little pools on the, on the coast? that actually led to your career? Like, like, why did you decide to go down that path? And then what did you do to start studying that? Yeah, oh, well, I honestly believe that every little kid, everyone is born a true scientist. Like, every little kid, it's just filled with questions and with this curiosity, and they're just naturally explorers. 
And I guess I kind of, I was lucky enough to be able to just grow on that and develop that. And as, as I grew older and, and now that I'm older, I'm still, I haven't lost that trait of like being amazed and fascinated about all the natural world and the marine world. And still like the more I learn, the more questions I have. So I guess that can be applied to anyone. And yeah, I guess not everyone really follows their dreams, but I've been very lucky. And I started studying marine biology in Ecuador first, but it wasn't very related to conservation. And I, I knew that I wanted to protect the animals, um, help them actually be, be a, a voice to all, all these animals that couldn't speak for themselves. So I got a scholarship to go to Australia, and that's where I did my bachelor's degree. And I honestly had the best education I could, I could hope for. So yeah, I, that was one of my dreams, go to Australia and study there. I mean, it's the best, it's a hotspot for marine science, right? And I love that you brought this one specific part up, because even though I, I know that going to Australia, especially as a marine biologist, had to have been a dream come true. But what was it like leaving your home country of Ecuador and traveling literally as far away possible as you could possibly go <laughs> down to Australia? I mean, what was it like? What was the, the pros and the cons, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Yeah, sure. I mean, yes, definitely on the other side of the planet. So from Ecuador, it takes like three days to get to Australia and the time difference is crazy. And of course, as, as like the Latin culture, we're very family oriented. So like, I guess leaving my family was hard, but also they knew that, that, that I was following my dreams. And actually like my parents call me like little fish because they know I'm just so happy in the water. So when I, and I was going to Australia, yeah, I was mostly excited about it. Not really, not really like sad. And also I knew it was going to open all these doors and possibilities and like expose me to all these things that in Ecuador I wasn't really able to do because in Ecuador, even though it has a lot of potential and it has a lot of different ecosystem and unique species, like science, especially in mainland, it's not, it's not developed at all. It's, it's still at its very early stages. So I knew that if I wanted to make a change and actually come back to Ecuador and and have an impact, I needed to I needed to go away and like be exposed to all these things and then come back. Wow. Talk about being super courageous. Just like thinking about yes. you know, you at like 18 years old and being able to put two and two together that you loved your country so much and, and the opportunity that you wanted to save the wildlife so much that you knew you had to go in order to come back. I mean, that says a lot, you know, a lot of people don't have that courage. So please thank yourself for that. Cause now we're going to start getting to all the really cool stuff you've done because you did have that courage to leave and go to somewhere else for a while. I mean, your, your entire bachelor's, that's a long time to be away. But I, I guess that then though, once you are somewhere and you're there for a long time and you have all of these connections and these relationships, why did you come back? Why did you come back to Ecuador? Well, oh, I've always like another dream of mine. So like one of my dreams was to study in Australia. Another dream of mine was to work in at the Galapagos and actually work towards the protection of animals in the Galapagos. And I remember the first time I went to the Galapagos Islands when I was 11 years old and I was on a boat with my family. And I was so amazed and so shocked by this incredible place. It was paradise. So I said to myself, when I, when I grow, when I'm older, I really want to come live here and work here for a while and actually protect this place. Like talk about self-fulfilling prophecy. Like, yeah. I don't know, but that, that's, that actually happened. Like I was in Australia. I knew I was going to get all the, all this formation, like professional formation, but, but I had Galapagos in my mind. So as soon as I finished my bachelor, after studying for four years, I went to back to Ecuador and then straight to the Galapagos Island. And that, that's like, I guess that's, that was some, like life changing, definitely. And yeah, we're going to dive into that very soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, literally and figuratively, we are diving into the Galapagos. Yeah. We're, go we're going to go from, from the shallows to the deep sea and then back yes. to the shallows. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, okay. Well, but, but how did you get to the Galapagos? I mean, honestly, like, so, okay, okay, okay. I guess just, just put the timeline 
in, in, in for me and everyone listening, was there a certain project that brought you there? Like, were you like your senior year in Australia and you're like applying to these all different things? And is this where the topic of today's episode, sharks, came in? Or <laughs> what is it? Because, I mean, I've been to the Galapagos and it is one of the most incredible places i think on this planet i completely agree with you it is it is magic it is pure magic but with that it, it's hard to get there and then also to study there i can't even fathom like how hard it is to get like an internship or or a job or, or whatever it is a research position so how did you get to the infamous galapagos okay so first i guess being very 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 consistent super pers- almost like i i I wouldn't say like I harass my supervisor, but I kind of did. <laughs> but, so like when I was in the Galapagos, I was studying corals at the Great Barrier Reef. So I was like trying to find my niche, I guess, within the marine biology field. And so I was like, okay, so I'll do corals. And there are some corals at the Galapagos. So there, there are not many corals. There used to be a lot of corals there, but a huge El Nino event completely wiped them off. Oh. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll look for like a coral project. So I started looking into all the researchers and their profiles and trying to contact them. And then I saw there was an ad for like a job application for a deep sea project, the Sea Mountain Deep Sea Project, which it was a super a, rel- a new project, completely new project. And I said, well, there there are also corals at the bottom of the sea. There's like is deep sea reefs so i said oh well i might i might go into that project also because it was super attractive the idea that we were exploring uncharacterized environment and the idea of being able to find new species that were completely new to science and and i was like oh my god would i be able to like name a species if i find one that's 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 the thing i had on my mind i applied for the internship and and i also contacted my supervisor so the it was so the supervisor. So when I when I had the interview, they were like, "Oh, I see, I see you. You emailed us, and you like filled the application. And you're like, you're very very keen and pumped. I'm like, yes, <laughs> this is my dream. So I guess just being persistent and being going after what you really what you want. That's that was the main thing that got me to the Galapagos, I guess. So the beginning of 2017, I started at the Sea Mountain Deep Sea Project, analyzing videos of from AUV, so autonomous underwater vehicles and ROVs, remote remote operated vehicles as well. And like manned submarines as well. So I Oh my god, at, you did. Uh, That's so cool. It, yeah. <laughs> oh I didn't I didn't go on a submarine. I really wanted to, but oh. all the expeditions happened happened like the year before I was there. Oh okay. so but but yeah anyways. But I I analyzed over 80 hours of video and just taking frame grabs of any like cool animal that I would see so like if I see like a weird shaped sponge or a weird shaped fish there was a fish that was like like pancake shaped fish and it was actually a new fish new species to science that and we named him Paco so that was funny oh my Um, (laughs) Paco the flat um, pancake fish (laughs) it was a pancake fish so funny looking and and the video I was analyzing had a remote operated vehicle that had an arm and and like a suction like a vacuum cleaner kind of device so you could see like you could see a video of the fish and like oh it's so cute and then it will get like vacuumed by this like device <laughs> just get, like, it was like it just it just something like no Paco, but it's in the name of science so so chances are like everything most of the things we saw through the video were new and actually we got to catalog over 80 species that were completely new to science or like new registers for that area so that was very very cool <laughs> yeah i mean did you get to name any of them by chance did that actually come to did that happen so so i found that you need to be a like an expert taxonomist to actually do that Um. so i'm not there yet but one day maybe (laughs) (laughs) i have my own pancake fish maybe (laughs) your own paco (laughs) my own paco Oh, that is that is so cool. Yeah, because I was actually checking out your research gate and I saw that some of the first entries on there and there were actual photographs of some of the species that you helped find and classify, which is so cool. So I know that we talked about that, you know, in, in our last call. And so I really want to just see that. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they're right here. And, and 80 species new to science. 
I mean, one would have been cool, let alone yeah, 80. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was also cool from exploring just three sea mounts at the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And there, there, it's estimated that there are about 400 or more sea mounts. Sea mounts are like this kind of islands in the middle of the ocean, like underwater islands. They host a lot of coral gardens and sponges and fish. And then they aggregate like as, as you go up the food chain. So commercially important species such as tuna fish or I don't know, wahoo or other fish species, they aggregate around these sea mounts. So sea mounts are super, super important. And uh, not a lot of people know about them. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't. That was awesome. That's so cool. And I have to ask, out of curiosity, so you had mentioned that the Galapagos used to have a thriving coral population, but then there was a certain El Nino event that knocked most of them out. Could you actually tell us a little bit more about that? And, and maybe when it, when it happened, was it a natural El Nino? Meaning like, was this because of climate change? Or yeah, maybe just give us a little bit more background because I, I didn't know about this. So I please oh. teach me. Yeah, sure. So so El Nino events, it will end so events. So El Nino Southern Oscillation, they happen in the middle of the Pacific. And they're very natural. This, these events happen every three to eight years. And the Galapagos is located at the epicenter of this event, right? So this, this event involves South America, and also Southeast Asia and like the coast of Australia as well, like that part of the, of the planet. So when there's a Nino, there's a shift in the atmospheric pressure and like trade winds shift all these currents that makes all these nutrients they stop and the water temperature the sea surface temperature rises a lot like in the galapagos um water temperature can rise from 18 degrees to 32 which is like incredible hot whoa and, that is a crazy swing it was crazy and it's actually like on the coast of south america we have a lot of a lot of rain and actually a lot of floods and on the other side of the planet so in australia for example there'll be there'll be droughts so it's like we have this contrast in effect and i remember so what the most extreme el nino event happened in 82 and 83 that was it, that has been the most extreme el nino um, of the century and that actually made like 90 percent of coral population or 90 percent of coral species in the galapagos to die off and it completely changed a lot of marine ecosystems in the galapagos like so many there were some rocky shores that were filled with algae and corals and after that it was just pure pure rock like bare rock and there was another El Nino and but that was natural I mean it was very extreme but natural and then there was another one in 98 97 98 and I remember that because I was six years old and our house flooded I remember like all the, this like big wave of water just coming in and a lot of people would be out in their kayaks or like on their <laughs> titles or just because the entire city was so flooded so yeah El Nino happens and actually right the, the opposite of El Nino is La Nina which means cooler temperatures and actually we are we are living one La Nina event at the moment wow I really didn't know that and and again since I I'd been I island hopped and I'd seen a lot of just the the ecosystems especially around the islands I was not aware that there used to be a ton of corals so like Thanks for giving me a little natural history 101 there. I, I, I really didn't know. And also, too, because like, I, I think the most surprising thing to me when I was there, because it's on the equator and it's so hot, but the water was so cold from the Humboldt current coming up. Yeah. So to right. think of such a drastic temperature change like that from 18 to 32 Celsius is like mind blowing. And, yeah. and has, has there been any, any recovery really since then or what's happened? So there has been some recovery, like some in the north, especially in the northern part. It was found that there's like a chimney of like a vent of cold water, and that actually helped support this cor coral reefs. Well, I say coral reefs, but imagine like tiny patches, not like not like the big barrier reefs. Actually, in the eastern tropical Pacific, there are some corals and coral patches, but not actual reefs like in the South Pacific or in Asia. If you want to see loads of corals go to that side of the world in the eastern tropical pacific you're going to see more of the big animals so yes there has been some recovery but still it's very delicate and like you said 
the water can be the the temperature it can be really warm and sunny but the water is very cool and that's because of the currents that go through the galapagos and actually the humble current that comes from the from chile like from the southern ocean and then the cromwell current that comes from the middle of the pacific towards the galapagos they are very cool and nutrient rich and they actually support populations like penguins which in the galapagos are the only tropical penguin in in the world and thanks to this current they can they can live there and thrive so oh my gosh yes i totally snorkeled there i have this <laughs> unbelievable video it was one of like the coolest moments of my life because one i was seeing penguins like i was on the galapagos on the yeah. equator seeing penguins like does it get cooler than that i don't know and i'm in like a full wetsuit because the water's really cold <laughs> and i had this yeah. gopro and i had it out in front of me and you know like there's sea lions around because they're super playful as you as you know as we're going to dive into (laughs) here very soon but it like came up and it was like there was this like baby sea lion and this like penguin and they were like swimming with each other and then there was like this penguin came right up into my face and have like this video of it stopping and like (laughs) looking at me and ah god the galapagos is just such a special it was amazing i have video of it i think i posted it i I went in 2018 (laughs) So this was this was a while ago, but That's I think awesome. I still have video that, of it. That was that was on a Nina year, so that was a very a, a very especially cold year, and but oh. a very good for marine, marine life. So that's awesome. You get like the penguins and the flightless cormorants as well. Yes, and the marine iguanas. Like, yes, you're not going to see them <laughs> anywhere else in the world. So it's such a it's such a unique place. And you, like you said, it has the Galapagos has the magic that makes you feel like you're you're one you one of them. You're a part of it. You're in and another animal that lives there and yeah you feel you you feel like that there's no separation between like oh the sea lions and me it's like no you're another sea lion when you're in that yes oh my gosh you make me want to go back <laughs> so bad it is and like since there aren't any land predators or anything so because i was there in april so there was a lot of nesting birds and they had their nests and their babies and there was this <laughs> nasdaq booby i still remember this this little baby and it was playing with the wing and like showing off and like throwing this little wing at, just because it was having fun and just wanted to show off to us. And several other like the frigate birds were like they were mating and oh, and it, you were just walking around with them. It was unbelievable yeah. because they I mean, like the Ecuadorian government has such an amazing job protecting this very special place. And so it's still pristine as as pristine as it can be i you know yeah, it's, it's right. like it's like a flagship for pristine ecosystems but as we know as biologists it's not it's not completely pristine but it's pretty damn good you know in, in the grand scheme of the planet yeah. but okay <laughs> so let's transition and i can stop fangirling right now over these islands <laughs> and let's start talking about your big massive research project that is blowing my mind and i can't wait to dive I keep saying dive into it. It must just be, I just need to stop it. <laughs> keep getting into your incredible project because what this, this wildlife phenomenon that we're going to talk about is high on my bucket list of things I want to do. And you like studied it for years. So ugh, I'm so excited to talk to you. <laughs> so let's get into all of that. How, how did we get to sharks? So we, we did all of this amazing, you were studying corals in Australia you got to the Galapagos, you were setting these sea mounds and, and I helping identify all of these brand new species new to science. And then we get to sharks. How did you get to sharks? It was funny. So I've always loved big animals like whales, sharks, mantas, everything. But I didn't know I was going to study them because they're highly migratory and mobile. So I'm like, well, I guess it's easier if you study corals. They're just there and you can <laughs> go see them all the time they don't move they don't migrate they're there oh, or like little or like sea stars i i used to growing up i used to get super excited every time i i would flip a rock and see an ophirid which is just like a sea star it's like it's related to the um, sea urchin um so i was like okay i'm going to study this because it's they're easy to get and easy to see you can visit them all the time but no after after i finished the seamount project i applied for a grant to study hammerheads there are a lot of hammerheads in the galapagos island that's actually the northern part of the galapagos darwin and wolf islands are known as the sharkiest place on earth like one of the sharkiest play- places on earth and there was a study in 2016 that determined that the this islands these tiny islands in the northern part host one of the largest biomass of shark species in the world so if you go dive in there you would see 
big whale sharks, like potentially pregnant big mama whale sharks, and schools of hammerheads, schools of silky sharks. So I applied for this grant to study the ecology, the feeding ecology of the hammerhead sharks because this, this wasn't done before in the Galapagos. There was a big like, knowledge gap in that area, especially not exactly what they were feeding off, but how they were using the reserve, like how they were foraging, what strategies were they using, what areas were they exploding, and also like what their niche was. So yeah, I got this grant. I received this grant in 2019. I was super excited. And as part of this, we had to go to the northern part of the of the reserve and free dive among hammerhead sharks because That's they're super unbelievable. Easy. They're they're super shy. If you go with the scuba gear, they would go away because they don't like the bubbles. So you had to be like like a ninja underwater <laughs> with a <laughs> using using a Hawaiian sling that had a modified tip. And it had a biopsy dart. So you were you were free diving with this Hawaiian sling, and then you would like draw the sling and puncture or like puncture the base of the dorsal fin, but it was a tiny, it was like a mosquito bite for them. It didn't hurt. And then we obtained like tiny samples of their muscle. And and then we took it to the lab. So a lot of like feeding studies look at, at their at the species stomach content, but because we're in a marine reserve and in a very protected area and also because i don't condone like invasive studies like i don't like killing animals for the sake of science there are other ways now especially with technology so there's no need to do that really we looked at the stable isotopes of the samples which are this element of these very stable elements that you can study so everything's made out of isotopes as we are all made out of atoms and the isotopes are just another versions of the atoms. They have different neutrons. So you have lighter isotopes and heavier isotopes. So we look at carbon and nitrogen isotopes that would tell us different things about the animals. So like if we look at carbon isotopes, we would know if they were feeding in the coastal area or like how deep were they feeding or if they were using more oceanic areas. And then if we look at the nitrogen isotopes, that will tell us how high or like their position on the tropic web and how, if they're feeding down the foot web or up the foot web so that gave us a lot of information and there was another layer to the study so we did this for four years it was a four-year study and during that four-year period an el nino happened and also at la nina so we could see how their strategies and their feeding behavior shifts with climatic events and the climatic variability so that was an awesome thing to learn and understand. So I had a lot of fun doing this study. Okay, we're going to dive in. Oh, I, got, I got to stop <laughs> saying that. Okay, I really want to understand this further. How exactly mm -hmm. does, you know, a heavier or lighter nitrogen or heavier or lighter carbon tell you these things? Like, like how, does, how does that work? Yeah, so it's based on the principle that you are what you eat, we are what we eat. So we incorporate all of the chemicals and all the information of the food we ingest and we store it in our tissues. And you have, you have this light and, heavy, light and heavy isotopes. And so the ratio of them will tell you a lot of information. So for example, lighter isotopes in the water, lighter oxygen isotopes, they evaporate with temperatures. So then you, you then you know that if you take a sample, you you, you might be you might find more heavy isotopes. So like this, this proportion or this ratio tells you a lot of information. So if you have higher carbon readings, that will tell you that the the organism are feeding or the species is feeding closer to coastal habitats because coastal habitats are super enriched in carbon. They're highly, highly enriched in carbon. And as you move to offshore environments, carbon signatures decreases. So that that's how you read it. That's how we interpret the results. So we look at this ratio. And then with nitrogen as well, the, the predators will take in the nitrogen of the, their prey. So the higher you are in the food chain, the, the higher your levels of nitrogen will be. So for example, an orca or like a white shark 
which are super tough predators, they are going to have crazy high nitrogen levels in their tissues. So that's that's how it works. Yeah. I got you. Okay. No, that's really helpful. So if they're feeding, oh, tell me if I've interpreted this correctly. Correctly. So if they would have high levels of carbon, then they were feeding more towards the coast. So does that mean they were eating more? Just like kind of just like lower bottom fish, like fish. And then instead of versus maybe like a tuna that's higher up the ecosystem. Um, I don't know if they eat tuna. That was just a guess. But meaning like, because I, I specialize with predators on land. So I guess I'm just trying to make yeah. an analogy in the water. So like, so like, let's say that we have our top dog, hammerheads, and they were eating like meso predators. Maybe that would be like a tuna or something versus maybe like the herbivores, <laughs> which are like the bottom <laughs> fish. I know that this isn't a correct analogy, but I, I'm trying to understand in the way my biologist brain works. Is that kind of similar or or not? <laughs> yeah. So as sharks, as other animals, sorry, as lions, if they they also have like a favorite prey item. So for example, if a lion is, they have gazelles all the time around them, that's that, and they have other animals, they're going to choose the gazelle and they're always going to go for their preferred prey item. So sharks are like that as well. And hammerheads love squid. With Ooh. squid is also with squid is also it's not like down the food web. It's like a miso predator as well. Squid, and they take vertical migrations at at night. And so the sharks love squid. And also, they're highly rich in oil and nutrients. So that's their preferred prey. They love it. Although they can eat other things, they can eat anything, right? Like sharks are apex predator, and they can. They are like the white cells of the sea. They maintain the health of the ocean, mm. but they love squid. So when there's when the conditions are are good and temperatures are stable, and it's actually kind of like a little bit colder than usual and nutrient rich waters, there are a lot of squid available. And hammerheads will stay in one place, so their niche is very very narrow and it's very very specialized. They would just feed on squid, and they're happy on, happy to eat squid. Uh, but then when conditions change and the water gets warmer and the squid is not readily available, they might like, go deeper, they might not undertake this migration and sharks cannot find their preferred prey. They would venture into, they would take these big migrations and go and feed somewhere else. And they could eat maybe herbivores, maybe like other organisms down the food web. So that's how, that's how they behave. So their niche, become, they become more or generalist and opportunistic and they actually they actually might be feeding on anything they could find but not like highly nutrient preys it's just like anything that they encounter so this this shift might actually also alter their nutrient intake and their overall health oh that makes total sense thank you so much for helping <laughs> helping my brain also understand this and hopefully for anyone listening too so then Super cool then that you had a La Nina and an El Nino during this study. So what did you find? Yeah, so we found that 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 they're super resilient. As soon as their conditions conditions in their environment change, they have so they have very they have a preferred temperature and a preferred prey, like I mentioned, but and they're happy if the conditions are stable, but as soon as they change for so when El Nino happened. They just they just went away. They just went off the coastal environments. They went outside the the Galapagos Marine Reserve boundaries. They were feeding in pelagic ecosystems, depleted in carbon, and and yeah, they just their diet shifts from being specialized to being generalist opportunistic feeders. When conditions are harsh, they just have to adapt. But they're very resilient and very flexible. So as soon as they conditions change, they they go away. But during La Nina years, so in 2018 was La Nina year, and they were their niche became sp very specialized again. They were eating squid. They were super happy. They just stayed in coastal environments, so mostly around the northern part of the Galapagos. So you just stay there in this this tiny around these tiny two the tiny islands that were no world islands. So yeah, there's no need to move or go anywhere else if you have everything you need and everything you like right where you are. So that's what happened and we could demonstrate that after this four-year study and after looking at their isotopes so yeah, yeah that was exactly. our results and it was, it was super exciting it was the first first of its kind kind of study for the for the galapagos marine research that was 
very helpful as well, especially these studies are very helpful for the Galapagos National Park Directory. They plan the zoning scheme and they, they, they are the ones that have to divide the area, the Galapagos Marine Reserve and actually designate areas like fishing areas or tourist some areas or like no take areas. So they use this, these sort of studies to be able to designate. Yeah, so we, after this study, they could, they could say, oh, we know that this species is used in this coastal environment for this part of the reserve. Maybe we can protect that even further and take other measurements. So this, this type of studies help to conserve these populations as well. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. And the fact that I was there that year and I had no yeah. clue. Yeah. You were in La Nina what? year. Well, that was an awesome year to be in the Galapagos. And actually, I was there. So you were there too? I'm, I'm, I'm sad that we didn't meet. <laughs> oh, if only we could go back in time. Oh, that would have been incredible. Yes, I was there. Uh, did you visit, did you visit the, the Charles Darwin Research Station? I did. Wow. The, I was there. Oh my God. That was so funny. Like, Imagine if we like we like crossed paths. That, that would be so funny. <laughs> we probably did because we took a tour yeah. of the entire area, and then I got margaritas you, with my guide afterward. And you went and you went to see Lonesome George. So the mom, his mom is fine now. Yes, yes, yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> girl, well, what is That's going awesome. on? Right now? That is crazy. <laughs> We were literally, um, literally in the same place at the same time the same in the same time. part of the world. What is a small world? Shut up. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> well, this just means we need to do it again. We need to have a reunion and actually know that we're yes. going to see each other. <laughs> yes. Let's go. Rewild Biology live from the Galapagos. <gasps> Shut up. I would get, oh my gosh, I could get Daniela and Josie and I could have you and we could just do this like ultimate girl powwow from yes. the galapagos with guides whales sharks and then me for fun yeah yeah that'll be awesome let's do it oh next my year God, let's oh, do it maybe let's do it let's freaking do it okay everyone you heard you heard this is happening so just come with me oh <laughs> yeah come to the galapagos oh okay 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 yep all right well, I'm just going to ear, ear tag that and we're going to go back to that. But OK, before we move on, though, I still have so many questions about hammerheads. And for those that are watching, watching this, you, you created a presentation. So if you wouldn't mind, do you have actual visuals of your hammerhead research that we might be able to talk through? Don't worry, everyone. If you're listening to we'll make sure we talk through the visuals as well. But yeah, they, I, that'd be so cool to see your to see your work and and actually see these hammerheads because apparently I was there at the right time, but I didn't see any. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. um, so I have some photos from the field. She's super exciting. Um, so that what you see now is I'm harassing, uh, like chasing a hammerhead <laughs> shark with the Hawaiian sling, just free diving. I actually took free diving course, like the Patty free diving course to, to do this research. So that was awesome. Um, so that this is like they were on a like 50 meter, like down down the water, 50 meter depth. There was a, this was a platform, and the hammerhead shark were just cruising there, and you would go down with the white sling. You can see it. I'm holding it, and it has a biopsy dart at the at the end. Oh, and then I would like stick that to the the base of the dorsal fin, and that's how how you got the samples. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. How long would you, so like, how long would one of these sessions take? Like how long do you have to hold your breath? And, and I guess I've never, I've never free dived before. So I don't, I don't know what all that entails to safely be able to do this. So yeah, what was, obviously you're almost there. You're almost to the bottom of the ocean right now with the shark. So <laughs> oh, yeah. what, what all did that take to do? So so everything is, is about the breathing and actually there's a lot of meditation and breathing exercises involved which sounds so simple but it's actually it's incredible like before doing this i could hold my breath for like maybe a minute and a half and after the course i was able to do it for almost four and a half minutes what? so it was okay. it was incredible <laughs> i was like yeah free diving is it's a completely different world like you scuba dive and then you go you, you free dive and it's another it's, it's another world so you have to hold your breath maybe for maybe for less than two minutes here you always need to do it in pairs so you have like your dive body you also have like your free diving body watching you from from the surface and you would go down and 
take the sample and then go back up and then the other person can go down so so always one going down and the other person just watching over you and doing this it was incredible because there's not in that place remember it's one of the sharkiest places so there wasn't only hammerhead sharks there were only also galapagos sharks which are super territorial and they were not happy that we were there oh so as i one time as i was as i was doing this i i was almost about to puncture to get the sample and then i look up and i see this this like three meter long galapagos shark just swimming towards me at full speed so angry oh that God. i was there trying to intimidate me <laughs> saying like this is my territory and get out and but I, i'm not afraid of sharks and with sharks they're super sensitive to to like energy and in general mm. with the electromagnetic fields but also with the person it's just, just like dogs or like any predator they can tell if you're super nervous or if you're you're acting like a prey so if you have this attitude that's like, hey, I'm here, I'm doing my, I'm minding my business, I'm not doing anything, just go away. So that was my, my attitude at the time. And so I stood there and going like, what do you want from me? Just like that. <laughs> and, and the shark, but he was so close and he started to circle around me and I never let my, my eyes off of, of its eyes. And we never stopped making eye contact. And I, in my mind, I was like, what do you want? Like, and <laughs> so it finally realized that he, he couldn't intimidate me. So it, it just went away. And I, and I went up to the surface. I, I wasn't, I didn't realize that I wasn't breathing for that. And for that time, <laughs> I guess like the adrenaline and the excitement for having this super close encounter, encounter with this massive animal. I was just, my, yeah, my adrenaline levels were all over the place. So I was just, super excited and happy to have lived that and as I, I came up came up my dive body was like oh my god that looks super scary are you okay I just saw like this tiny person next to this massive shark and I was like yeah I'm so happy like that was one of my best experience underwater with a shark so far <laughs> that is insane that is that oh my gosh that is so cool that is so cool you just like I think you did earn like a badass badge that I didn't even know that someone could earn, but you totally got it. That is incredible. You like stare down a three meter shark in one girl. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You're next level. That's awesome. Yeah. I think to earn the badge, I need to swim with white sharks. I haven't done that yet, but maybe soon. It's on my list. <laughs> oh my God. That would be amazing. Would you go to South Africa for that or? Yes. Where, what destination would you would you want to try that? Well, out? in Guada, Guadalupe, Mexico, is a really good place for that. Also, South Africa. Well, sure. you're way closer to that. <laughs> you're yeah, in Mexico. I'm, I'm, based, know, so. I'm based. I'm based in Mexico, so I'm I'm closer. <laughs> yeah, that might be yeah. a little easier of a destination to go try that out at. <laughs> yeah, actually, we also looked at at baby sharks well we were so we're looking at baby hammerhead sharks photos there you can there in some nurseries like mangrove bays you can find baby hammerhead sharks and we actually took samples from them as well that wasn't part of my study but with with all the all the samples we took and analyzed there has been like four research articles which is awesome but my i led the one with the with the adult hammerhead shark this is a baby hammerhead shark study <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. So uh, so right now we're looking at two visuals of two sharks where you're holding one to take a sample and the other one what well, is being held up in the air. So around, I guess, just teach us a little bit about these sharks then. So actually, yeah, could you like give us just like some spew some really cool facts about hammerheads and then maybe also tell us how old these little babies are? So I would be like, no, I have no concept of age in sharks. So <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um. Actually, the way you can tell they're newborns is if they have the, the umbilical cord scar on their belly, um, and that's how you know that they're just they were just born. These are probably like a few months old because you can you can't see the scar in the photo really on the on the belly the ventral side. <laughs> uh, so hammerheads they they have this hammerhead like shaped head, and they're actually the the, mole, the most I would say like evolved sharks evolve. Their detection system is super advanced and they actually use their hammerhead head, their hammer, their hammerhead yeah, <laughs> to like pin, pin, pin down some of their prey. So there was actually a photo taken recently of a um, great hammerhead shark pinning down 
an eagle ray or like a ray <gasps> what? just on the, on the ground and just like with his head like an actual hammer so they use they use their head as a tool to eat which is crazy and they and they can they can navigate they they're super sensitive to electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic signals and actually they use sea mounts so this is how sea mounts and sharks are related so hammerheads use sea mounts as underwater um, highways to guide their big migrations and it's crazy because scientists have put tags on them to see how they move and how, where do they go and actually you can see the the tracks from the their tags they do like 90 degrees turns like they 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 like swim straight if they're following the seamount chain. And if they, if it changes, they actually will like completely turn and follow the seamount chain. So seamounts are like their highway. Well, that's so cool. So like <laughs> all of your things are just like naturally coming together. That's yeah, amazing. They're, they're, it's like connecting line, but, but they're highly, they're overfished because they take this long migrations. They go outside reserve. And they get caught at a spy catch, but also they're targeted for their fins. And like, this, which is so sad, like a hundred million sharks die like, every year for their fins and hammerheads are not excluded. So, mm. so yeah. And also because they take these long migrations. So there are some studies that, that demonstrate that they go from, for example, they, they go from Galapagos to Cocos in Costa Rica and to Malpelo Island in Colombia. They, there's this triangle that they use, they move around, but, and they also go to the mainland in South America to give birth. So there, you can find baby hammerhead sharks in mainland Ecuador as well and in mainland Colombia. So that's, that makes them more vulnerable as well because they, if they feed in one place, they reproduce and in another place and they have to move between these places they just get caught all the time so mm. but yeah so that's that yeah yeah and, and i definitely i've definitely heard a lot about that triangle migration so when i interviewed frank garrida he was costa rican and worked on whales and talked about the exact same triangle so it seems that maybe several large sea Mar like marine species must use the same migration route like right yeah for sure it's a, yeah it's like it's it's a very specifically highway and actually a lot of megafauna so turtles whales and sharks they use the same route to move around That's so yeah so it's cool. the same it's like they have their own highway their own water highway yeah yeah because i remember in that episode it was like 50 episodes ago what that's freaking crazy I actually went to went to Costa Rica and actually got to meet Frank and everything, which was really, really cool because that, um, oh my God, I don't, maybe you, maybe you know what it's called. I totally forgot. But that whole area was just protected. Like it just happened. That whole like triangle highway had just gone under protection for like international waters from like where it went, like from the Ecuador down to Costa Rica. Like that whole area had just been put under some sort of really high strict protection, which was yeah, really like, incredible. Like this, this year, the beginning, the beginning of this year, so end of last year, beginning of this year, an extra sixty-six, so sixty thousand kilometers square was added to the existing Galapagos Marine Reserve, and that actually connects it, the Cocos Island Reserve with the Galapagos Marine Reserve. So they're now kind of connected, but governments are still working in putting in place all the all the protection and the monitoring the patrolling system and all the strategies are yet to be determined like they're still working on that but yeah it was recently declared like the expansion of the reserve it's called la hermandad reserve right so right right that's good news yeah incredible news i mean especially for for your sharkies here uh, yeah. this, uh, oh my gosh that's so cool it's so cute that little that little baby on the right is so adorable <laughs> <laughs> baby shark <laughs> Okay, like, yeah, your baby like, shark. They have this bad reputation because of jaws from the seventies. Like that's so old school. Like we need to shift our mentality. And like sharks are not killing machines. And if we look, they're they're actually very cute. You know, they're not they're not they're not mammals. They're fish, but they're still super cute. And they need to get rid of their bad reputation. Yeah, I mean, and not it's just like, I mean, I study predators on land. It's 
there's just all of these misconceptions, you know, about it. I mean, especially when you're talking about a predator that is in a different medium than what we live in. I mean, we live in air. We are we're a land species. So you even take away the fur on these predators because at least them on land, they have that, you know, because usually mammals are considered cuter. But you, you yeah. take away the cuteness that humans are able to connect with, you know, the more like us, the more we usually think something is cute. And then so you take that away and you put an ocean around it and you're like, it's so yeah, poor sharks. They have so many things going against them, which is really unfortunate <laughs> because just like you said, like they are the white blood cells essentially of the ocean. Like we need our apex predators in our ecosystems yeah. to keep them thriving. And this is a perfect example of that. Yeah, we need we need healthy oceans. And like us in Earth, in, in ocean, like every, everywhere in the planet, really, everything is connected. And like sharks are connected to corals, to coral reefs, and to sea mounts, and to everything. So we're all connected. Like healthy oceans also concern us. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. So then after, after your incredible research that you were able to then, you know, give to the park and and be like, look at this, look at all these crazy things we found. We know exactly what the sharks do, depending on the climactic whatever is going on at the time, which is awesome. So then did your work end here? It was this the end of your hammerhead shark time or did you continue on or what was what was the next phase of your work with sharks? Yeah, so so this was. So after analyzing all the samples, and I also analyzed samples from baby American sharks from, from Colombia and Costa Rica. So there's a, there's a regional study coming up soon, but that ended. So my chapter with hammerhead sharks ended for now, just for now. And <laughs> then I I moved to another shark species that is also very understudied for the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And these are the thresher sharks. So I went like from hammerheads to thresher sharks. And now currently that's my subject of study and i'm obsessed with them they're super <laughs> cool so thresher sharks have have this super long tail that is like functions like a whip and they actually use it like that they use it to hunt and stung their prey so they would swim up to big schools of fish and they would like a flip they would flip over and whip their tail and stung their prey and that's how they feed which is amazing they can also jump out of the water there are three different species and they all they are all very very highly understudied and they're also super vulnerable like the rest of the shark populations so right now i'm doing and doing the same study kind of the same study that i did with hammerhead sharks but now with pressure sharks that's what i'm working on at the moment and i'm super excited about it well look at that tail <laughs> yeah that is absolutely crazy so then yeah let, let's let, let's start actually talking about this now. So you're doing similar work. So does this mean that you are able, like, you know where they are and you're able to go take samples or how are you collecting your new data to start learning about these sharks? Yeah, so thresher sharks are more elusive than hammerhead sharks. Their schools are not as big as, hammer, as hammerhead shark schools and they're very elusive, very rare to see, very hard to find. They're, they are all over the Eastern Tropical Pacific, but to have an encounter with them is super rare. And like the, the, all the, the time that I was in the Galapagos, I never saw one and, or, or I would never hear from a, like a guide, like a naturalist that mm -hmm. they, they've seen one diving. So it's very, very rare. But on 2019, there was some illegal vessels fishing inside the marine reserve and they were caught by the Ecuadorian Navy. And they actually had a lot of sharks on their bodegas. It was so sad. And amongst all the shark species that they caught, so they were they were targeting sharks. It wasn't like incidental or like mm. bycatch. So they were caught, of course, they were sanctioned. And some of the scientists from the Galapagos Science Center were able to collect all these sharks, this that thresher sharks. And I received some of the samples. So I'm studying their vertebrae. And in their vertebrae, you can see growth rings. So just like trees, sharks have growth rings on their vertebrae. And you can age them. You can know what's their age. But also you can see, you can divide the vertebrae in like three segments and be like, okay, these rings are from the 
newborn stage, these rings are from their juvenile stage, and then these rings are from the adult stage. And if you extract the powder, so like the vertebrae is made out of many things, but collagen, amongst those things, and you can we can study the collagen from the vertebrae to know, to also know like where are they feeding, what are they eating, where are they moving, what environments they are exploding. So now I'm working on that. So looking at shark vertebrae and also obtaining samples to do the stable isotope analysis on them and uh, yeah, study their feed, feeding ecology. And are you hoping then, so it sounds like they are very elusive. So are you hoping that this will be like a baseline study? So it's like, okay, if we know, since you, you were amazing and taught us about the nitrogen and carbon differences. So if they're mm -hmm. eating, most, like if so, if it's dense in nitrogen, then you know that, that they're further off from the coast. And then if it's really carbon rich, then they're more towards the coast, correct? And then you might be able to go see if you could find them <laughs> after that. Is that the goal or hope? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Or because we, we don't at the moment, we don't know how they are using the reserve. We, we just know that they are around somewhere. So they might be just just cruising along, just like migrating from them. They might be feeding there. That's what I intend to find with this with this study. If they're how are they using the reserve? If they're actually feeding there, or if they are feeding in another area, just passing through the reserve. If they if they're feeding very deep, in that if they're consuming like highly like nutrient rich prey items or what items they're consuming. So trying to just assess everything about their feeding ecology that we can, and. Yeah, definitely. This, this study will be a baseline study for this species, especially because uh, there was one study done for the pelagic pressure shark, but but I'm also studying the big pressure shark, and to date there are no studies on these species. So it will be a baseline study. So I'm excited to see what comes out in the results. Uh, yeah, it's gonna be like it's all me. I figured this out. That's so cool. <laughs> that is so yeah. cool. Oh my gosh, Camila, that's awesome. We're gonna be like, I'm gonna figure this out. We're gonna get the baseline and then we're gonna go find these sharks. Like, <laughs> oh, dude, dude, that is amazing. Girl, yeah, when, so excited for it. Yeah, so what's the timeline on that? When do you think you'll be able to analyze these samples and then have at least a heading on where to possibly go find these sharks? Do you know when that might happen? So next year, Next summer, maybe I'll, I'll, it's going to be summer, but I'm going to be a lab rat. So I'm going to be in, <laughs> in all the lab doing all the analysis. I'm not going to be out sunbathing and ha working on my tent. I'm just going to be. Yeah, oh, you're going to do that too. On Come <laughs> on. You need life balance. You can't be just in the lab. <laughs> right. <laughs> so next summer I'll be analyzing the samples in the lab and Hopefully, I'll, I can start writing up the results as soon as possible. And yeah, my intention is that next, before the end of next year, I will have like an, art, an article out or like out for revision. I will definitely write like popular articles, maybe a blog about it. You will definitely find out maybe. Uh, yeah, so we'll have to tell see. you like, yeah. um, I need to know. So you're going to come back on and we're going to talk about it. We'll, <laughs> so. we'll do a follow up. Definitely. Yes yeah the show isn't stopping uh, anytime soon so. <laughs> so so that's the time and and then like and then like go with go with the authorities talk to the galapagos and national park directory see what we can do maybe we can do another study for i'm sure a lot of questions will come up out of this study just like everything in science right uh, there's always more and more but the more you know there are more questions but that's exciting and that's what i love about this it's never it's never ending Thing. you're always gonna find new things come up with new answers come up with new theories and then prove them that's what's amazing about science so, oh my so gosh, yeah, i'm excited so cool. to see what comes out <laughs> that is so cool and just to also know that we're sitting down with you after you have done incredible work with hammerheads and pretty much have the baseline for the activity their feeding activity in this amazing national park and then for the next stage like now it's like phase two and now we're at the very start of this other really cool species like I didn't even know that this shark existed. And like, I mean, that tail is amazing. So anyone, if you're if you're not watching this right now and you're listening, like if you're if you can safely Google, it's Thresher Shark. Just look it up. 
and see this insane tail that they have and how streamlined they are. They must be really fast, I would imagine. Like they, they look like they could just like cut through the water so fast. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they are. And they can actually go as steep as 500 meters or wow. even, even more. But yeah, there actually will be videos on YouTube about that shows how they hunt and, and how they, you have to see it, like how they flip their tail and like whip it around and all the fish are just like stung. They don't know what just <laughs> happened to them. And then they, they go around and eat them. It's incredible. You should watch it. <laughs> so how long are they? So like, it's like, what's, the, what's their size in comparison to the maybe like I a hammerhead? The big eye thresher can be as long as like 4.5 meters. Oh, that's way bigger than I thought. In total length. In total length. So actually, these are bigger than most hammerhead shark species, but there are nine different hammerhead shark species. And actually, Mm. the great hammerhead shark, which is like the largest hammerhead shark, is also about the same length. But they're definitely bigger than the scallop hammerhead and the smooth hammerhead. Those are the ones that are more studied. These are bigger, definitely. Wait, so then what ones are in the Galapagos? In the Galapagos, you can find scallop hammerhead sharks. There are also like some smooth hammerhead sharks, but the, the big schools you see, they're mm-hmm. scallop hammerheads. So, so the scallop hammerheads, they have an, an indentation in the middle of their hammerhead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's how you tell, tell them apart. Oh, hence the scallop. Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hence the smooth. Oh my gosh! Okay, no, I am no, learning no. so much right now. Yes. This is incredible. Yeah, actually, actually, there are like the nine species of hammerhead sharks. They all have different head shapes. One oh. of them is more like a shovel. The other one's smooth. The other one is skull. Yeah. So you should also look it up. I, <laughs> yeah. Know. I did not know any of this, so I definitely am going to do. A, I mean. We're sitting down on a Friday, so I'm going to do <laughs> after just, this. Just I, go, I need to Google and YouTube and all kinds of things right now. Yeah, this is awesome. Just go down, go down the rabbit hole. Go down the shark people. The shark yes, hole. Just <laughs> yes, I support that. I support that. Everyone get a glass of wine or a whiskey and please. Yeah, just... on a Friday, a Friday night. Exactly. <laughs> Because that's what we do as biologists. We just like start. Or it can, it, can, it can turn into a whole week. It, it can be like your shark week. It can be yes. shark week. <laughs> An actually educational shark week. Oh, that's awesome. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of, so I think this is a perfect time to bring up the actual conservation of these species. So, yeah, I mean, the whole greater point of doing all of this research, obviously, is to be able to keep our sharks here. It, yeah, it's wonderful to know what they're doing. But the bigger thing here is why. Like, we need to know why so that we can protect them. And so CITES just happened. The big summit just happened. And a record-breaking number of marine species were put on. And... I would love if you might be able just to teach us more about the the big picture here. Where does your work fit in all of this? And then maybe if you can also tell us a little bit more of what happened at the CITES Summit and why were all of these animals put on? I mean, yeah, just like spew conservation on us right now and and conserving these incredible animals. Yeah, sure. So to start, you don't have to be a shark person or even a marine biologist to protect shark. Like we said, everything is connected. So everything you do has an impact on everything, like from sharks to deep sea corals. So there are a few things we can do. So first, uh, there was a a CITES conference in Panama recently, and over 50 different shark species went into this appendix. So their trade is going to be more regulated. They can't be, their fin trade is going to be heavily regulated now. So that is the good news for them because they're overexploited. So there's an estimate that we've killed like over 90% of this large, of the large fish on, on the ocean, which is insane because these, 90, wow. like sharks, sharks have survived over, they have been here on earth, like over 500 million years ago, and they've Right, and they've survived all this time, but now we are like humans have a massive impact on their population, which is like we're their their biggest predators, and they look after our oceans. They keep it healthy, so we have to protect them. So a few things we can do, and I've made a list of six ways to help sharks, and anyone can do 
any of these things and and everyone can become a shark advocate you don't need to be a scientist so the first thing would be learn all you can about sharks because we don't we can't protect or we can't love what we don't know so the more you know about sharks and their role in the ecosystem the more you're going to love them and want to protect them also also like share your love for sharks on social media like go out if you're on holiday if you live away from the ocean but you go holidays to the ocean just try and be in the water as much as you can and and or if you don't want to be in the water with them you can love them from afar you can go to an aquarium <laughs> and also learn to them learn about them and and spread your love and talk about them with people you know i'm sure if you ask anyone around you about sharks they will say like oh they 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 eat people they are killing machines and that's not true so that you should you should start changing people's perspective as well and then donate to conservation initiative you really want to you can adopt a shark actually there are a few websites that you can that allow you to adopt a shark so you can name a shark and adopt a shark and you can learn about your local organizations or or i don't know if you if you have a specific organization that you like that's doing conservation actions for sharks for example you know like everyone knows sea shepherd greenpeace like all, all these all these cool organizations that are taking action so maybe see if you can get involved with them or like donate to that to an organization also make smart choices when it comes to secret and supplements a lot of people don't know but a lot of people say like, i'm not consuming shark because i'm not eating shark fin soup but you might be consuming shark and not knowing so there are a lot of cosmetics and supplements that have shark oil in it a lot of omega-3 supplements that have this espoline ingredient and that's oil shark and it comes from the liver which is like the oil list the it has a high content of oil and there are alternatives to this like so every time you're going to eat seafood or buy an omega-3 or, or fatty acid supplement you just make sure it comes from a sustainable fishery i was actually reading some blogs about some doctors and there are actually alternatives to spoiling and this there are other ways to get your fatty acids and your omega-3 levels higher so you can have you can consume flax seed oil or like hemp seed oils or like a, a sustainable fishery like for other fish not really not not specifically the shark so yeah trying to look for alternatives also the nuts avocados you can find all the essential oils in those foods so there's no need to like consume shark <laughs> i'll also if we decrease decrease your single use plastic usage so also sharks are prone to get tangled in fish nets in fishing lines in all of these and they need to smoke the majority of them need to swim to ventilate their gills and actually breathe so when they get tangled they drown mm. so also be be careful with the plastic of course and if you're if you like to recreationally fish like just go fishing on holidays just be be careful with your with your lines mm. and then also participate in coastal cleanups it's, it's so easy to if you go going you're going to have a beach day or into tan and join and play in the water you can just take a bag and just pick whatever thing you see and you're making a huge difference they're also for sharks for any any marine animals i'm sure everyone has seen the video of the marine turtle with the with the straw in its nose yeah that we actually so had that we had her on this podcast yeah, that's yeah. awesome mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah um, absolutely everyone has seen that and after that it was there was a massive shift in straw consumption everyone's mm-hmm. like no no straw or like bamboo straw or metal straw whatever and so this thing the same impact and the same yeah the same like actions should be taken to protect sharks as well so yeah those are my my advice and things everyone can do any anyone can do all of these things absolutely and r- thanks a yeah. lot also for talking about the seafood and supplements because I don't think that that's talked about enough. I mean, I, so I'm really adamant on my health and I do take a fish oil supplement, but I didn't even know as somebody who tries to get like high quality stuff and everything, I didn't even know that it would be possible that there could be shark in there. So like, thank you for even bringing it to my attention. And Mm -hmm. I even try to be a smart consumer, 
but I, yeah. I might be doing a cardinal sin and I had no clue myself. <laughs> so thanks for bringing that to my attention. And I definitely need to go read labels and make sure that that yeah. particular um, liver oil is not in there. But again, yeah, thank you for that. I mean, we all hear about palm oil and, you know, like all of these other things, but yeah, we could be consuming shark and have literally no clue. Like, oh, yeah. man, it's so crazy how sneaky some businesses can be. <laughs> yeah, it is. And actually, it was it was there was a recent news about how most people don't know that in Australia, if you go for fish and chips or like if you see flake, like fish flakes, that's actually a shark. Or if you're eating fish and chips, you're eating the fish is comes is shark, like 30 percent or more of the fish food that we that we eat is mislabeled. So what? So that's a huge problem. And sometimes you go, oh, I'm I'm going for for fish and chips. In some places they're called lemon fish or something, and it's actually shark. So maybe when you're when you're out and you want to eat fish, you just ask the local, just ask the people that serving you the food, like where did this fish come from? What is what is it that that we're eating that we're putting in their bodies? But also we need to protect this population. So yeah, we can be we have to be smart consumers, definitely. Wow, I didn't know that. And there are alternative there are there are alternatives to this. So we don't we don't need to keep killing the shark population. <laughs> we. We can get our essential oils from other things. Thank you for teaching all of us that. That is, <laughs> I mean, you're really my mind. I honestly didn't even know that. I've definitely ordered fish and chips a few times, like, in my life. But, I mean, I've, we've definitely made it myself. But sometimes you just really want some tasty, deep-fried, you know, beer batter <laughs> fish and chips. Yeah. And sure. I, I would, again, I just... Me, I do this every day. I have degrees. I'm a conservation biologist. And still, I didn't even know these kind of things. So thank you for teaching me and then teaching everyone listening that we just, just need to take that extra step and, and making sure that our omega-3 supplement doesn't have, you know, shark oil in it. That just double checking at our restaurants, like, hey, what, what type of fish is this? Because when it's like a white yeah. fish, I just assume, or unless it like says that catfish or something, like... I just assume that it's, yeah, just like a white fish, you know? Wow. And to know that it could be, yeah, could be shark, especially to where I might be in whatever part of the world I'm in, because, you know, I do travel quite extensively. So, woo, man, thank you. Yeah. That you, is yeah, that's so scary. helpful. You might be, you might be eating shark ah. without even knowing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like. man, man. Wow. Well, Thanks for that. But we need to know this stuff. Like, this is why we talk to experts that know these things and can teach us these things and help all of us make the world better. But whew, yeah, no, thanks for that. <laughs> so yeah, I no, think thank you. Thank you for this space. Yeah. <laughs> You're very welcome, dear. To, to spread to spread the love. Yes, because we all need to love our sharks and all of our apex predators across yes. the world. Yes, I totally agree with you. So and next, I, I want to shift the conversation to you again now, now that we've been talking for a while and, and we've did, I'm going to say it again, we did a deep dive, all, <laughs> all things hammerhead and thresher sharks, and then just our, our ecosystems that are, that these fish are, are in, which is really incredible. So again, I want, I want, I want to talk to you, talk about you for a second. So everything you're saying is incredible. Like, you're the first to do these baseline studies on this really famous species of hammerhead shark in this incredible place. And now you're starting this brand new study on this shark that has almost nothing in science, known to science about it, other than it exists. All of that is super sexy and is like super freaking awesome. And like that is something that, you know, you could go on a TED talk, you know, TED stage and talk about. <laughs> But there has to be another side to this. There has to be some days where it kind of sucks. And do, is there like a particular struggle or some story that you might be able to be willing and comfortable to share with us about sometimes when things haven't gone right or things that you've had to overcome in your journey so far that you would be fine and OK sharing with us? Um, sure, I guess. Well, there are two sides of this, like in relation to like shark and being in science at the moment, it is a struggle, I guess, because 
you know, we have climate change, we have all this pollution, all this thing that plastics is a big thing. If you if you look at the news and like there's there's a term for it, it's um like climate anxiety or like conservation anxiety where you when you're like, oh my god, I feel useless. The world is sending like we're causing so much damage. But so on a daily basis, especially like in the science world, you learn about like I'm surrounded by my peers that are also doing conservation studies or other other species. But if you look at most of the studies, it's like, yeah, the populations are decreasing or these populations in danger or highly vulnerable. And you're like, oh no, like all the animals are going yes. extinct. Like it's so depressing. So so for me, ocean is my like my therapy. Every time I just looking at water or if I'm surrounded by water or if I think about these interactions or actually go out and explore and try to connect with the Camila from when I was a child, just being so amazed and happy. I try to go to that all the time. And I love being out of water, of course, learning about this animal. So I try to focus on the positive side of things and what I can do. And I guess that's what we should do. Just focus on the, focus on the positive thing while being smart and responsible. And then the other struggles, I would say for me, has been like academic struggles. It's funny because I've always been like, oh, grades don't matter. Like you, that they say nothing about you. And for me, like I've had, I've never done well on exams. Like I get very nervous, but that's, that's how you're evaluated in most universities. So like in the academic, through grades and scores. So, so I don't do well with that. Like I'm, I'm very good at I like doing essays or reports or conducting studies, but actually like studying, sitting down for two hours and just answering questions, I get so nervous. Mm. So, and it's funny because I also, I, I appreciate the academic world, but I don't think I'm very good at it. Like I'm, I'm trying to, like I'm, I'm, I'm more like a hands-on person and I love looking at the big picture. So when I have all these technical in-depth questions, I like, I struggle a lot. So and it's also funny because I do want to go down that road. Like after I'm doing my master's degree at the moment, and after completing that, I want to go on a PhD. And I would love to go on a postgrad somewhere and just keep studying and learning. So I, I kind of like made my peace with the academic world and be like, I'm not defined by grades. So like, yeah. So those are kind of like two things I deal with on a daily basis, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and at the end of the day, I mean, like, look at the look at the stuff you've done. I don't, I don't care what you got, and you're like <laughs> biology, like five hundred one or whatever crazy level class you had to take. You're like, look at the work you're you're doing now, and yeah, it's unfortunate that school is only done in one way now, like, because we all do have our own strengths, and some people might be really good at academia, but they suck with the hands-on stuff, or vice versa, you know? Like, yeah, we all have our own ways of doing science, and it just kind of sucks that science is now an academia box, if you know what I mean, and it didn't used to be that way, you know? So Yeah, it's, it's, it's not actual, and also, like, with the, with the publishing of studies, mm. like, a lot of people are have this mindset that, oh, no, if you don't have hardcore statistics, if you don't have these super complex equations and models and things that no one understands, um, if you don't have that on your article, then that's not real science. And that is not true. Like, if you go, if you go way back to, like, I don't know, where Charles Darwin was doing science and you look at the writing, it's just so poetic and romantic. It's like, oh, I see this turtle is doing this. I think it's because of this. The way it moves is not like it's like reading poetry, but but like science, scientific poetry. I don't know, and that has changed a lot. To like nowadays, a lot of articles are kind of like very written in like in a robotic way. You're like they have yes. all these equations and numbers that no one really understands. So I'm also on a mission on like making science fun and accessible to people. So I, I love writing about nature theme. And I also, I have a column at, at the local, uh, the national newspaper in Ecuador. And I write about nature related things and scientific discoveries, but in a very, very simple and fun language. So like everyone can understand. So I'm going to miss you now about on making, making scientific writing fun again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I <laughs> am so in support of that. 
I mean, that that's, the, that's one of the whole missions of this show. Like every single time I sit down with a scientist specifically, like a conservation scientist, that's the whole point. It's like, yeah, we could go through your paper line by line, but who... What are we going to gain from that? Like, what was the really yeah, no. cool stuff that you really liked about what you did? And what did you learn from it? And then, yeah. And then, I mean, me being a trained scientist, like I can read those papers, but I'm very few far in, in between, you know, like, and even then some of them, I'm just like, what did you just say? Like, did you, <laughs> what, did, what did you say? I, I don't even know. I need somebody to translate this. I think you're speaking yeah. English, but I don't think you're speaking English. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you explain me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that that's that's incredible. And and yeah. It's like it's like it's like a computer software could have written this. Like where is the <laughs> where's the, the human and the and the soul? Like <laughs> yes. where is the passion in your scientific article? Yeah. Oh, great. So is that column then in Spanish or is there an English version that people could read too? Or is it both or is it English or uh is it in Spanish? Uh I don't think I don't know if the the newspaper website has an English like version. Mm -hmm. Uh you can if you're an English speaker, you can practice your Spanish. Yeah, you can <laughs> use Google Translate. It's, 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 it's Google Translate. It's a very it's written in a very simple language. So if you're learning Spanish, go go read. That's read actually my cool. That's, That's actually funny. a good test. So yeah, if somebody is working on their Spanish, then you can go read yeah. some science columns from Camila. That would be that actually sounds kind of fun. It's a kind of fun test. Yeah. <laughs> if that you can translate, I've been thinking about starting a blog, maybe kind of like from because I, I have a lot of journals so kind of like a field journal kind of blog something fun yeah i don't know i'll let you know yes definitely keep I, us posted something in, Eng in english yes <laughs> absolutely and there might be an a, like an upcoming like blog version that's going to be attached to rewatology too so if you ever want to be featured oh. on that on the brand that's already established go ahead girl i will put whatever you want up there so <laughs> <laughs> because so, i also awesome. don't have time to write so if somebody else wants to write and it could just be like yeah. a whole list of just like you amazing people just doing guest posts like i am totally game i got the platform we can put it up there so yeah i just don't have time <laughs> right <laughs> but if somebody else loves to write like please you're a lover but you're you're amazing you get to chat to all these incredible people <laughs> yeah i guess i will i will keep on the the audio version so if somebody else wants to write please by all means it's, <laughs> it's an open that's an open invite please open come percent. please come awesome. and we will build we will build the whole part on the website we can definitely do that i, th I think it'd be really fun it's actually been a big goal of the show so if you want to like test out the waters i keep making really bad dad jokes but if you want to test out the waters and and put uh some <laughs> I english think, i think you're me you're missing the ocean the i think i am you, yeah I'm literally too, as too far much. away from the ocean as physically possible. So, like, I couldn't be more central continental right now than I am right now, like, physically. So, continuing down, you, what, with everything that you've done, and you have this incredible attitude, and you're, like, spearheading these amazing research, do you have any advice for anyone listening that you would like to share? Um, advice for, for people doing research? It's just are... anybody like if you have a special message or or anything like what would you what if someone could walk away with like one powerful message from you what would you want that to be so one powerful message would be just getting out there and being in nature any form like not 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 like a marine or or specific to the ocean but just being in nature interacting with nature it really it really helps you develop this like keen eye or like sensitivity to it and it just you just become more empathic, empathetic mm -hmm. with any living being, and I think that's the way you can you you get to protect all these living beings. So just being out there, interacting with nature, and really getting to know like your local flora and fauna, and then just doing things to protect them. And yeah, that's a that's a take up message. Also, just remembering everything that you do, every little thing has a big impact on the rest of the world and plan the, the system so just be responsible and be careful and be aware of this it's a huge responsibility and yeah absolutely those are really great and if somebody might want to read more of your work and maybe see the things that you've done or maybe even get in touch with you what is some of the best ways for somebody to go about that um sure so i'll 
I can, I'll love to interact via email. So I could leave you my email or even like, oh, we well, can, you can say go ahead here. and say it if you're, if you're fine saying it. And then I also have all of these links in the show notes at the website, oh, okay. but yeah, yeah, it's both. <laughs> well, I'll say, I'll say my email, but, but also like if, if you come, so I'm in Baja California soon, if you come visit this place, this is very touristic. Just give me, give me a, give me a shout out. I'm so happy. I've, I've actually worked as a tour guide in a forest in Ecuador. So I just love taking people around and exploring nature with people. So, so I love that. Also, on my, I'm very active on social media, like on my Instagram. That's my Instagram is Camila underscore Fanes. And then my email is K-M-I harness at gmail.com like my last name is like harness but in spanish (laughs) (laughs) yeah so that's an easy way to remember oh and of course just like i said i will have all of these in the show notes at realology.com but camila thank you again for spending your friday with me and teaching i learned so much from you already and i cannot wait to have margaritas or pina coladas or whatever we want in the Galapagos together one for day. For sure, we have, we have a pending <laughs> trip, definitely. And also, I'm going to be in Mexico for two years. And uh, this is the aquarium of the world. The marine life here is incredible. So also, if you come down, please visit me. I we'll, might have we'll to make that happen. We'll go on a, an ocean safari. I love the sound of that. Yay. <laughs> I love the yes. sound of that. Oh my God, an ocean safari. I'm game. Everybody, let's go to Mexico. Um, <laughs> done. And we're going to go see Camila and she's going to take us on Ocean Safari. So, yes. done. <laughs> yeah, awesome, dear. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much you again. again. Yeah, thank you. It's been a great, great way to spend the fr- Friday afternoon. I love it. <laughs> wow, what a fun and informative conversation with Camila. I am absolutely serious, by the way, about one day meeting up with Camila and the other fabulous Galapagos conservationists on the show. If the Galapagos Islands are on your travel bucket list, reach out and let me know you'd like to receive updates as plans come together. Email me at hello at rewardology.com or DM me on any of Rewardology social media accounts. It's pretty easy to get to me. If you have a specific question you'd like to discuss about today's topic, head on over to the Rewildology YouTube channel and submit your question in the comment section of today's episode. Some of you have reached out and asked how you can support the show. Well, I'm happy to share that there are several ways to do so. Some zero cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewildology newsletter at Rewildology.com, subscribing to the Rewildology YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support this show and help keep these stories on the airwaves, consider making a monetary donation at Rewildology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewildology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this show will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Heather Valley, the show's audio and video producer, for making the show sound and look awesome, and Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focus Right gear we use to record the show, head on over to rewildology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends, together we'll rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.